Um, good morning to all of you. Guten Morgen. Ich bin um, Dr. Tony Sylvester von der Universität of Western Cape in Kapstadt. Und das ist, ich bin hier, I'm honored to introduce my colleague and also a true testimony of what prevention work can do. Because Gibson um, Janica started out as a youth at risk, went through the program, and this is where he's standing today. And he's also now the, um, develop, he works in a developmental center where he was, but he's also now the um, operations manager at the institution where he came in 10 years ago and worked himself up through this process of healing. And he also applies this to his students now. So I'm gonna hand over to Mr. Jenica and ask him to start doing his performance. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sylvester. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Gisborne Jenica, as I was introduced. And I represent a company called, organization called Chrysalis Academy uh, from South Africa. Chrysalis Academy is located in Tukai in the Western Cape, in Cape Town. And we are fortunate to be right up in the mountains. And we've got a beautiful estate where we do our work. The work that we do, we are in the youth development business. So we work with young people as Dr. Salvesta has mentioned, that are at risk and that might be, you know, going onto the wrong road or, or wrong side of life. So we work with them. Our program, however, is completely voluntary. So we do not force anyone to be part of our program. Um, it is voluntary, it is three months, and I will explain a bit more about it. So, a healing-centered approach to youth development or to, to violence prevention in youth development. And if I should explain it to you like this, the work that we do with young people focuses on the deep-rooted trauma that they have experienced throughout their lives. So when people hear about our work and our organization and they see how our staff dress, We've got a uniform, our program is regimented, so our students stay there for three months. We use the disciplines that you might see in the military, where they would have to make up their beds, they follow a structured program. So when people see that, they, they kind of think that we're a rehabilitation center, or they think that we are the military. But we like to say that we are not, because with no offense to systems like the military, the military takes you on as an individual and they almost break your character and they create this person that they want to see. Where with our work, we take you as you are, we recognize your strengths, we also recognize where you are not quite good yet as your weaknesses and we build on them. What we'll be discussing today is a, a brief background of Chrysalis Academy. And we'll also discuss our holistic approach to youth development. I think that term holistic approach is quite important. And when we get to that, I will explain in detail. And then we'll talk about what we experience when we are working with youth. And then we will share some of the outcomes of our program and, and Afterwards, you can, you can ask your questions if you want to. You are also free to ask questions in between. If I'm not clear, you, you may ask me to repeat something. So a little background of Chrysalis Academy. We, were, we started in the year 2000, and we were set up as a social crime prevention program. And we are funded since that year by the Western Cape government. Chrysalis Academy over time has evolved into one of the leading academies in youth development in South Africa. Interestingly, up until, so from 2000, up until the year about two, 2017, our vision has always been to be the leading youth development organization in South Africa. In 2018, our management and staff had to gather and we had to have a strategic session because we have reached that vision. 
we were recognized as the leading youth development organization in South Africa. And, and as I will explain to you later, our vision is now to become a global leader in youth, de youth development. Our organization is a non-profit organization and we've got a board of trustees that governs our business. Our vision, as I've explained to you, is to become a global or a recognized global leader in youth development. And I think it's exciting that I'm here today speaking to all of you, participating in this event, because with this, I think we, we even much closer to this vision. I'm hoping that I cannot only talk to all of you today about the work that we do, but I'm very much hoping that you know, I can find you to, to get some interest in the work that we do. Whether it is that you employ some of our strategies and our approaches to youth development, or perhaps that you can ask us to share a bit more with you. So that is the purpose of this presentation today. Our mission is to provide a platform for youth to really deepen their resilience and to unleash their potential. We are very much focused on this term that everybody's got potential, but with the help from good programs and good relationships, we believe that's how potential is unleashed. And that is the business or the core business of our work. Just to explain to you the chrysalis process, I think, I think yesterday when we did the walk um, for, the, for the evening event, I saw in the park there was a bench and a similar uh, 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 poster and I don't know if that's a butterfly sanctuary or not, but I stopped for a long time and I focused on it because I, I kind of, you know, this is what we do. So chrysalis is this entire, sorry, chrysalis is this entire process, this entire process where we have the egg and the butterfly is born. That process is called the chrysalis process. And I think my colleagues from yesterday and today, for those of you who listen to them, they've already set a good picture for all of us of what South Africa looks like with crime and violence and the economical challenges and the social challenges that's in the country. It's a real difficult place to be in right now. And with the work that Chrysalis Academy does, we are more focused on the future of, you know, of the country, which is right now our young people. And we are saying because, Chris, because South Africa is a country that is, you know, the, the majority of our population is young people. And with those young people, like my colleagues have, have explained, the crime and the violence is pretty high. So hence why we are focused on them and we're doing our work with them. But this chrysalis process is where that egg turns into a little caterpillar and that caterpillar goes and it goes into the cocoon and the co after a process that's very difficult for that caterpillar, it turns into a butterfly. We, we say that the work that we do on our state is really this process here, where it is really, really difficult. And I can imagine that it must be really uncomfortable and sore for this little fella to turn into that. Because if we look at this, it looks a bit restricted. It looks sore, it looks uncomfortable, but wings need to be formed in there a whole structure of the body needs to be formed in there. And I can only imagine with the wings wrapped around that little butterfly while he's in there. It, you know, that's where the discomfort comes. And this is the chrysalis work that we do, where we take young people who have seen trauma all their lives, who's had difficulties in their lives, some of them having used drugs, some of them having been involved in gangs, others perhaps having other social challenges, and those 
who perhaps have some issues at home with absent fathers, mothers. There's a lot of young people who, in South Africa who are heading their own houses. So the mom is a single mother, but she's not there because she's usually on the street. Prostitution, perhaps. Alcohol abuse, perhaps. The father is in prison. So those things are quite difficult. And when our students come to us, the work that we do is to really cover that. And with this healing approach, we don't ignore what you've gone through. We, we deal with it and we give you almost alternatives to work with the situation. And I'm going to explain why alternatives. As I've mentioned, the work that we do is holistic. And it is very much trauma informed, as I've been mentioning trauma a lot, because we, we're saying that we really cannot ignore the issues that the young people have faced because they, before they came to our program. But this is this holistic thing that we're talking about, where our program does the physical work with fitness. They do a fitness about two times a day. The first session starts at 4.30 in the morning when they are woken up and they need to go for their morning PT. So that's, that's a picture of one of the afternoon sessions at three o'clock just after class. Then there's the emotional work. The emotional work with peer leadership and peer support. This young man is one of our sports or fitness instructors, but he was also a student. And I'll explain later on how our approach is where we use people who've got the real life stories to work They've been through that experience and that makes them the best people to guide the students when they come onto course. And then we do the outdoor work that we think is really amazing because we take them out into the wilderness and they need to hike and it gives them an opportunity to explore Cape Town like they've never seen it before. My colleague yesterday mentioned that he, he met a young man that loves about 20 minutes, if I'm correct, outside of the city center, but he's never been to the city center. So when our students come into our program, that program basically gives them the experiences that they've never seen before or never had before. We also offer physical skills training and technical skills training. And like I've mentioned, apart from the emotional and other physical things. The sort of courses that they do with us are perhaps electrical training. They do first aid training and they do it up until first aid level three. Then we've got community safety and traffic wardens. So that's, that's also an interesting one that everybody loves. We've got the basic cookery. All of this doesn't entitle them to become professional chefs after they're done, but it's the basic skills that we find are setting them up with interest to perhaps go and study further in that field afterwards. Then we've got welding and metal work and firefighting. These are only some, but we've got uh, the barbering, we've got the hair and beauty for the women, and we've got a number of other uh, physical and skills training that we do with our students. Like I've mentioned, our outdoor program is really the program that does the deep rooted work. Because here we really slow down. We, we slow down. We are saying that we recognize when you're living in Cape Town or when you're living in South Africa as a young person, you're scared to go to the shop because a gangster is gonna see you and he's gonna want to not only take your money, but perhaps recruit you to go and sell drugs or get involved. My personal experience, and I was really lucky because of my resilience, but I couldn't even go to school because on my way to school, the gangsters will hand me drugs to sell at school. And if I come back this afternoon, Without their money, I'm going to be in a bit of trouble. 
And if you talk, your family is in trouble. And so now and then they will send a little officer out to go and check on you while you're at school. So our schools are not even safe places. So again, as an example of the things that young people go through in South Africa, the issue with this is it takes your childhood away from you because now you do not have an opportunity to play in the streets. You're 14 years old, 12 years old, you can't play in the streets because you must duck because the bullets are flying. You're 15 years old, you can't be out in the streets, you can't play at a park or on a field because you're afraid that you're gonna end up in trouble with the law because you might look like somebody. That's another issue. So our outdoor program allows them to really have a rare opportunity to revisit their childhood. And this is where we, we do water activities. We give them an opportunity to, to build rafts and, and practice leadership qualities. And I think the thing that they're very much exposed to is to think on their own feet. Because the work that we do, and I'll talk a bit about this afterwards, but the work that we do focuses a lot on self-empowerment. So our program, I can say, is a youth empowerment program. The three-month program is broken up into different phases, where for the first three weeks, we think it's quite important that we have an orientation phase, because how it works is we've got about 300, up to 250 most, we've, we've got up to 250 young people from all over the Western Cape with different religious backgrounds, with different cultural backgrounds, with different personal backgrounds, and we are gonna tuck them into a room of 10 and into hostels of about 100 as you can imagine, it can create some chaos. So in our orientation phase, we, we focus on teaching or rather facilitating soft skills. Skills like personal mastery, anger management and conflict resolution, things like diversity and leadership. So in the first three weeks, those are the classes that we run, where we, we're saying to them, and why I said facilitate and not teach, because perhaps these are not things that they don't know. They know it. But they've probably never sat down and someone explained it to them. So we think it's important that in that orientation phase, we teach them about the different cultures. Because if I am a colored person, and my friend that's in my room sleeping next to me is a Ishikosa person, which are two different cultures. His cultural practices, where he perhaps need to do some rituals before he goes to bed, might upset me. So that orientation phase will explain to the other cultures the practices and the beliefs of the other so that there is no conflict. Then we'll go into the outdoor phase that I've explained, which is about two weeks long. And the skills phase, where we then cover the other things that I've spoken about, the basic cookery, the firefighting and those. That's about four weeks long, and some of them can go up to six weeks, depending on the qualification that is done, or the requirements of the qualification. And then in the community and exit phase, we prepare them for graduation. So we have a formal graduation where we invite their parents as the VIPs and we dress them up in a beautiful uniform and we have a whole pass out, out parade like in the military and we give them an opportunity to sing songs and perform short acts or dramas and we ask them to express themselves because they have achieved something. For many of our students, this is a big thing because some of them perhaps did not even finish school. Others 
perhaps never got recognition for things that they've done good in life. So this graduation, we keep pretty standard and we, we keep it as a form of re recognition to them. And we also acknowledge those who did very well in their classes by giving them prizes, first, first prize, second prize. To talk a bit more about our approach, as I've mentioned before, we've got a team of youth instructors who were all students, who all came through the program, who act as peer mentors and coach the students on the course. I, like Dr. Sylvester has introduced me, I was on the course in 2012, three months, and today I am the operations manager for the training department. That means that all the instructors and all the coaches, the fitness instructors, everybody, they are managed by me. And I also manage the daily operations and I draw up the program, the structured program, with assist from other colleagues. So, and, and I've got other members that are part of the management of the organization that have also been students of the program. One of them was, the very, was one of the very first students when the organization opened its doors in 2000. So we had about four who, who are part of the management of the organization. And I think that there's real value in that because not only can we relate to the students or the student experience, but we can make the best decisions for the organization and for students. So I think that's, that's pretty amazing. We believe with this approach of us, we believe in fostering connections and co-creation. So that means that our work is not just about we are the experts and you are the student, you do what we say. We, we sit down and we do the hard work by listening and by getting involved and by building relationships. And as I've also mentioned that our work is trauma informed or rather trauma responsive with a healing centered approach. And we apply some of the latest research in neuroscience and we in particular make use of the polyvagal approach to trauma therapy. And to just explain a bit more about that, I'm sure that some of you, if not all of you, have seen this before, but with this polyvagal approach, the science says that there are different almost levels that an in individual goes into when they experience traumatic events. For instance, and the different colors, before I go there, the different colors represents almost the different states of emotion that I can be in. And with that, different parts of my nervous system will be activated. So, and, and like I said, there are some people in the room that might have, have more insight and experience with this than, than I do. So please feel free to also talk on this during the question and answering session. But we are saying that we would like to keep our students with the work that we do in this state. A state where you are regulated, a state where you are calm, and a state where you have enough time to make decisions. Because if you are in one of these states, perhaps you will experience rage, perhaps you will experience anger, frustration, then you will not be able, as we know, to make sane decisions or the best, to respond in the best manner. So, we are also recognizing that because of this deep rooted trauma that the young people have always been in with, with their lives. As I've mentioned, you, your environment at home, you hear gunshots, you're gonna be fearful. There's not enough bread in the house and you're hungry. Perhaps you're always gonna be angry. Perhaps things happen in your life and you're sitting with some mental health issues or challenges, 
you'll sit with depression, uh, depression. And as we know, this means that we can have individuals who could constantly be in this state or one of these states because of the things or experiences we've had in our lives. So this is the important part of this thing of focusing on the deep rooted trauma and this healing approach that we have. We are saying that we want to know more about you. We want to know about your family history. We want to know about your home situation. We want to know about your hopes and your dreams. On the first day when the students come to us, we ask them, what are your fears? You know, in regards to the program. So you'll be with us for three months. What are your fears? What are you most afraid of? Some will say, I'm afraid that I will be sent home because I will break the rules. Others will say, I recognize that there are other guys here and I'm afraid that one of them are going to trigger me and I might get violent. So that's important conversations that we have. And yes, ma'am? My fear? Ah, I, I, if I knew what it was, I can probably say it was personal, but I, I, th I don't think I can remember. But I can say that general fears that someone would have when you're on a program like that is disappointment. Perhaps you know that the weight that you carry from your family, you know, they, you coming here and everybody's excited and family members are posting on Facebook that my, hey, my son went to Chrysalis Academy, I'm so proud. He's going to change his life around. If you fall out of that program, you've disappointed your parents. So, so that can be fear to someone. Fear of disappointing. Others have fear of water because they've never been to the ocean. They can't swim. Some have fear of mountains. I, I could not believe that. Because usually when we hike, we get high. That we, you know, we're on high altitudes. And they say, but... I've got the fear of heights. So if I'm on Table Mountain and I see way down there, I'm afraid. So those conversations are important. And I think it brings us to this, that we want to deal with this. We want to work through this. And we've got the experts. So I'm not, you know, I might not be the expert, but we've got the experts that, that will then apply the work. Part of that support and the experts that does this work is we've got partners in the psychology sector that come in and others with good experience in, in counseling, professional counseling. So our students receive one-on-one -on -one counseling that is personalized and we keep it very, very confidential and only a small group of our staff have access to the you know, to the, to the things that are discussed in those counseling sessions. Um, and it's only on an executive management. And it, the only purpose of that, as you can imagine, is to further support the student. Some of them in the counseling sessions declare that they've committed crimes up to murder and no one knows. So you can imagine why we need to have that confidentiality. Others, and this was a personal experience I had when I counseled this student. And for the student to remain anonymous, somebody declared that they had unsureties with their gender orientation or identification. And the insecurities came because they said because of their culture and because of their religion at home, they know who or, or, or where they identify, but they can't tell this to their families because the families will kick them out. And Chrysalis Academy, because of our holistic approach, created a safe environment and a safe space for that student to live out or live the, the, their lives, you know, how they wanted to. And with our counts, the support of our counselors and the professionals, the student was also then possible to inform the families. And with that help, and I'm gonna come to that later on, our program does not only focus on the, on the student and the work that the student goes through when they're with us, but it also focuses on the families. So during the three months that the student is there, we have three family workshops 
where we then work with the families. At times, when, when it's necessary, we also get the families involved when certain things come out of the counseling rooms. Because students, like I said, can share some confidential things that might involve the family members. Some students declare to us that they have experienced rape by family members and perhaps the parents does not know. And then perhaps we are now left with that responsibility to inform rather the authorities or the family, but we always take our guidance from what the student would like to do, okay. you know, out of respect. We also have other support groups as part of our program and the support program. And these are things like the NA group support groups. I've mentioned the anger management program before because young mothers and young fathers, you know, teenage pregnancy is very high in South Africa. There, there is usually a very big chance that we will have a large number of mothers and fathers, perhaps at the age of 18 years old, as part of our programs. Some who does not have existing father figures, so you'll have, you'll have fathers. So on our male course, we'll have students who are fathers, but he will declare to us that I haven't seen my child since my child was born. I'm, I'm 20 years old. My child is two years old. I basically ran away from the responsibility. So a support group like the Young Fathers Group will focus on teaching this individual on how to be a responsible father. But it will also deal with the issue of your father not having been present in your life and how you cannot repeat that cycle as an example of one of those programs that we run. Then we've got therapeutic care uh, programs, one of them being the trauma release exercise. And again, we believe that sometimes you can carry deep trauma within the body. You know, the nervous system we know keeps the trauma, but then sometimes we also know that you can be so tense physically, your, your body structures, your muscle structures, and this form of therapy called TRE or trauma release exercise, there's a lot of research in it, but it helps you with a range of exercises to release the body and also release the nervous system. And stories from our students afterwards is where they say to us that that TRE helped me to relax. Um, and sometimes we'll have students that fall asleep within 20 minutes. You're not supposed to fall asleep, but just because it helps you to, to, to just relax and almost unwind, they'll fall asleep within the first 20 minutes of an hour long session. Yeah. And others will say to us, since I've gotten involved with that exercise therapy, I'm able to sleep at night. Things like insomnia is gone. Others would say body aches or discomfort in my body is gone. So there's, there's a lot of benefit. We have others like yoga and there are others, well, a lot more. I've spoken about the family strengthening where we believe that with family workshops, it's important that we keep in touch with families. We, we believe that not only do we say to the families, this is what your, your, your son or your daughter has gone through, this is what they've declared to us, but we are saying to them that you need to recognize that this person is changing around their lives, and when they come home, they'll be, you know, they'll be disciplined and they'll be structured, but sometimes they'll probably make mistakes. Students are saying to me, when I go visit them, they say, my, the biggest problem I have is my parents are now saying to me, when you were at Chrysalis Academy, you woke up 4.30 in the morning, but now you want to sleep to 11 o'clock on a Sunday. And we say to families, that's okay, because you need to give him a break if he's working Monday to Friday, and he wakes up a certain time, you know. So we, we're teaching parents to not be too much. Our curriculum threads, our mindfulness, the precision drilling is a, is a big part of the program that brings discipline and structure. Because again, like I've now men mentioned before, and this one is in reverse, some of our students, they, didn't, they weren't too disciplined when they were at home. 
Their time management were a bit poor. Some would sleep until the sun come out in the morning. Others will come home very late. An interesting thing about South Africa, especially Cape Town, you should, if you visit there, you should not be surprised that if three o'clock in the afternoon, you find someone walking around in their pajamas in a shopping center. So that's a big thing. And with our program, we even change behaviors or, or, or things like that. And things like the precision drilling, bringing that structure, bringing them their time management, th those are things that we really value really much. Then we've got our gender equity and reconciliation programs. And alternatives to violence, that's also a big program. And our stepping stones program. Our general admissions criteria, so who do we work with? A student must be between the ages of 18 to 25. They must have a minimum of having passed a grade nine. And this is only because the, you know, the intellectual uh, part of the program, they will be in class, so they must be able to read, they must be able, and usually we see that if someone did not have, a, or does not have a grade nine, perhaps they can't match the requirements of the program from education wise. And then we make use of the need status. This means that an individual must not be in employment, education or training. Because when you work our program, it can't be interrupted. It's a straight three months. You can't even go home to, to go and visit your girlfriend if it's a birthday or, or your grandmother. Although we, with family reunification and family strengthening, we do make exceptions if there's perhaps death in the family or emergencies in the family. You cannot have a criminal record or any pending criminal charges against you. I can imagine that everyone will understand why not. You don't? In South Africa, um, it's very difficult to find employment for someone with a criminal record. So part of our program, if you finish the program, You'll, you'll then receive some, so, some sort of employment and it becomes difficult. Does it make sense? Yeah. I think there are other programs that cater for them, but because of our work, we don't. That's why we don't take that, them on. And then you must be a resident of the Western Cape. So we, we don't unfortunately work with others that are not within that region. And as we're drawing to the close, I'll just share with you what we're expecting when we're working with young people. And this is again, just to give you an idea of this thing of the deep rooted trauma, of how trauma is deep within people. Since 2020, as we can, as we know, it's the year of COVID where COVID was so rough. We, have seen a decline in the quality of education and mental health challenges. And this is because in 2020, the schools were closed. You, you know, there was, people couldn't go to schools. They had to wear masks, they had to isolate. And then we started the online classes, even in schools. A number of people in South Africa does not have access to internet. So if your school today is having an online class and you don't have a computer and you don't have internet, you're missing out. And, and a small thing like that then led to a lot of school dropouts, young people leaving school because they couldn't keep up. And that means that an individual that now applies to come to, to Chrysalis Academy who went through that experience during that time, the quality of their education when we're working with them is a bit it's a bit challenging or it's a bit poor. We also see a number of about 10 to 25% of young people declaring suicide ideation. Or an, they've say, they're saying to us that at some stage in their lives, they have attempted to commit suicide. And then the big one, with links with, with my colleague that spoke earlier, we are noticing a widespread of alcohol and substance abuse amongst young people. 
because they've got all this time, they don't know what to do. And, and I've mentioned the other factors like, like gangsters that gets involved. And drugs and alcohol, as we know, it's the cheapest form of substances that are available on the streets. So they're going to go and they're going to get involved with that. We also experience, and this is interesting, we experience that young people are declaring food insecurities. Because of the poverty rate in South Africa, it's very, it's not rare that you will find that someone will say to you that for today, I have not had anything to eat. Or for the past week, I haven't had anything to eat. So when young people come to us, they really struggle to get rid of this mentality that I need to steal food, to store it, to have access to it later. We give them meals six times a day. You know, your three main meals and then your mid, mid snacks, midday snacks. But sometimes we still experience that some of them steal the food of others. There was one incident when a student went to the bin, took out the food, and, you know, so our response now is because we've got a disciplinary structure, we've got a code of conduct, do we discipline him for, for behaving like that? Or do we send him for counseling to investigate more? We chose to send him for counseling, investigate more, and we realized that he actually lived on the streets. So that, that deep-rooted trauma again, it's part of his almost natural response that when I see food in a bin, I take it. Um, I kind of hit the jackpot. So that's what we experience. We also see this embodiment of trauma. With males, we, we notice that you know, I've, I've mentioned before, but we notice the externalized violence. And they do this through fights. So when we've got males on a course, you can expect that there will be some fights. They will, you can expect there will be some arguments. And they're sitting with this deep-seated anger. So we, when we do our research and when we do our counseling, we track it back and we say that males naturally... In South Africa, they feel that they've got the responsibility to stand up for themselves. Because if I walk in the streets, and like I've mentioned, and I'm on my way to the shops, someone is going to want to mug me. So I need to, you know, I, I need to stand up for myself. So when you get into a, in a space with other males, instinctively, if things doesn't go your way, uh, you're going to want to fight. So that's what we see. And, and again, it doesn't have to be like that. It shouldn't be like that, but we are saying it's because this is what the person is used to. And, and our work is to change that behavior, is to change that belief by saying to them, you, you don't have to fight. Um, the anger usually comes from absent fathers. I don't know my father. My colleague spoke yesterday. He made an example of someone will say to me, you're just like your father. And that's something you shouldn't say to a boy from South Africa because he doesn't know his father. Or perhaps he knows his father is in prison and he doesn't want to be like his father. So that will cause a big fight. Other way around, you might say to a boy from South Africa something really bad about his mother. And that guy can, com you know, he can commit a big crime like murder just because of saying that, because of this love and sense of protection that he needs to have to, towards this mother that's raised him all, all through his life. Yeah, so, so those are the things that we see with our young people. With women, we see the implosion of anger. And, and usually there's a widespread history of sexual abuse. So women usually, they don't want to talk. Um, but when they do talk, they tell us how they've been sexually abused. On our previous female course, I was amazed by the record number of students that declared sexual abuse. Okay. okay. Just lastly, the nature of our work or the nature of the trauma requires, and we believe this, it requires a continuum of support. And we make, with the work that we do, 
we don't just go through the program and you graduate and you go home. We have a five-year aftercare program where we track and we monitor our students. And just to go to this last slide, so we've got a five-year ongoing support system. So it's a five-year aftercare program. We track, we monitor, are you still in employment? Are you still, as we would say, on the right path? And where they need, we all offer further support. And someone asked me yesterday what our success stories are or what our success rate is. And I said to the person that we, we believe that somebody who didn't have a matric or who, who, who dropped out of school before they came to us. And now they've got a grade nine, they finished our program and they go and they go and study further. That to us is a success story because you did not go home and you did not go back into your previous environment, as an example. And other outcomes of the program, our program is things like building resilience amongst young people and affording them rare skills. And I've, I've spoken about the experience to experience childhood and we give them this opportunity to get employment and, and to go and study further healthier lifestyles because when you're with us there are no drugs no alcohols and a lot of them choose to then maintain that and um, thank you for listening and if you have any questions i hope that i can answer them thank you Gisbon, for that very informative sharing of your work and the operations that happens there any questions that you have for Gisbon?